Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's really cool. I, uh, I enjoy every visit to Iowa. It's been so nice, but I need to just thank you for rearranging your lives, the babysitters you hired, or whatever is going on back in your houses. Thank you for wanting to come out on an evening like this and talk about something that's really so important. You might be wondering, oh, who am I to come here and start talking about this stuff? The only real difference between me and some of your, your teachers who are getting into this, this topic is that I've had a head start. I've been doing this since 1982, when our district said, we want you to do standards-based learning. Now, what does that mean, standards-based learning? And we start exploring that. Well, okay, you teach for the standards. You really focus on standards. You can't like do a, a hobby unit you like to do, like dinosaur unit in second grade. It's not really in the curriculum. You just like to teach it, so you throw it in. No, you really have to do what we say as a public institution we actually teach in second grade. It can't be something that's just whimsical. Okay, good. All right, so we'll do that. And then we start realizing, oh crud. We keep saying we're standards-based, but we don't do the assessment reporting side of it, i.e. grading. Our report cards don't even look like what we do in the classroom. Oh, and then we got tired of lying. <laughs> we wanted to sleep guilt-free at night. Your child, well, this grade, it represents what he knows about deciduous trees versus coniferous trees, whatever, and chloroplast, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, we wove in all the times he was quiet and used an indoor voice and brought a canned food for the canned food drive and covered his textbook, and mom and dad signed the permission slip. And the old time, he had his pencil sharpened before the bell rang, and practiced navigating hormonal issues successfully in the locker area and practiced personal hygiene. All that stuff put together, ah! We began to realize that there's a dichotomy of curricula. There's the publicly declared curriculum. I'm supposed to learn slope y intercept, how to graph an inequality, order of operations, how to isolate a variable to one side of the equation sign in math. Great. But there's also this hidden curriculum personal hygiene, how do you study for a test, how do you organize yourself. And we realized that the letter grades, in order to be valid and make decisions and provide accurate feedback and to document progress for all the stakeholders, the three big reasons why we grade in the United States, they had to be accurate. So anything that would fudge it was suspect. Oh really? Yeah. What we decided to do is, oh, you've got to report it in a separate area of the report card. And then the kids actually started paying more attention to it. So this is a grade of what you know about biomes, tundra, taiga, marine, bio, desert, biome. And these are the number of days you had your homework on time. It turned out kids responded to that quite nicely. And they elevated it. They said, whoa, what do you mean homework doesn't count? No, homework counts intensely. In fact, there'll be positive and negative consequences. It counts even more when it's reported separately. The more we aggregated into one symbol, the more everything was lost. Things were fudged. And teachers were playing bartering games. If you do this for me, I'll give you this. If you do, and then teachers would do things like, no, I didn't give you an F, you earned it. Financial economic relationships. And we realized, oh no, that's distorting the power of the grade. So we decided the grade should be what you know and are able to do at the end of learning cycle. Not the routes you took to get there. If you look at the math curriculum K-12, which I have done for every single state, I've also done science, language arts, history, social studies, PE, I know, I need to get a life, but I have. It never says in the math curriculum K-12 has a nice, neat notebook, because that's not a math principle. It is fundamental, and I think rather important that you have a nice, neat math notebook. But some of you who are in math, you did fine without, you had a messy one. But most of us do better if it's a nice, neat notebook. So what we found is the kids actually listened to us and they heeded that, that advice to have a nice neat notebook when we gave a separate rendering of its performance, their performance with that. And that really helped us. By the early 90s, we started having these report cards. It took us 10 years to figure this out. A lot of different pockets were doing just little pilots. And I understand you guys haven't really fully implemented things yet. You're just saying, hey, this is the direction we want to go and we're gonna start looking at the process. That's kind of where you are, and that's great, that's wonderful. And everybody needs to add some advice and insight into that. But we decided to start minimizing our hypocrisies. You have to understand something, school was never meant to teach. What? That seems awfully weird. No, 
Really, school is meant to meet the needs of the kid who gets it first. We have a factory model of schooling. Anybody needs more or less or different, school tends to conspire against that. In the 1870s to the 1920s, we had all the rise of factories. New immigrants are coming to America, all these immigrants. But we have a new thing called high school. How are we going to get them workforce ready? I know. We'll do an hour of math, an hour of science, hour of English, then lunch. Then we'll do an hour of art. Get them up, move them out rawhide. Some of you have no idea what I just said. <laughs> it's okay, it was an old TV show. But school should not be this cattle call. You do an hour of math for a while, then you do an hour of this. That goes against everything we've learned. Well, by the 1940s and 1950s, we had all the longitudinal empirical evidence that that doesn't work. It was just set up to get people through the system quickly, not necessarily as the best way to teach. And then we realized we're a democracy. We teach everyone, not just the easiest ones, everyone. And we're one of the very few industrialized democracies on planet Earth that actually does this. When I travel around the world, I get people, world leaders, who've come up to me and said, um, you teach everyone, not just the easiest ones. We don't report the scores of all our children. You do. And you actually keep hope open. In junior high slash middle school, we start sending people on their vocational tracks. You keep it open. It's not like teachers can say to parents, I mean, think about this, parents. The teacher says, these children you're sending us, raw resources, I can't work with them. I'm sending them back. Send me something better. <laughs> That's insane. We, don't, we work with everybody, and everybody comes at things at a different angle, different pacing, different levels of support, different frame of reference. So then you think about, okay, in school, you have to be good at every single other thing that every other kid is good at doing, during the exact same hour, the exact same day, to the exact same level of proficiency. It's the way we run. It's a factory model of schooling. But when you graduate, you self-differentiate. You gravitate towards those things you're good at doing. You have a skill set that represents that skill need. And when you're in the company, you have to be good at your job. But you don't have to be good at everybody else's job, the same level of proficiency. When I work with teachers, I often say, can you imagine you're the one that has to fix the boilers? But also, you have to be the special ed liaison for all the legal stuff at local screening committee meetings. You have to be good at teaching every level of the foreign language and every foreign language in the building. You have to be good at every single new technology innovation. You have to be good at grading and assessment and teaching all the sciences, all the English, all the social studies, and running the school building, hiring and firing teachers. You have to be good at being an ambassador with a larger community. All the stuff, you go nutso. You don't have to be good at everything. You have to be good at the thing you are good at doing. And you find meaning in the stuff you're good at doing. And it's fine. But K-12, we don't do that. So no wonder some kids are better or worse at some of the things they do and they need more support or less support. Imagine your impulsive 15, 16 year old self. There's no filter, there's no governor what comes out of your mouth, okay? Some of you look like you're in high school and thank you for coming tonight, but I am talking about you when I say this. <laughs> the teacher says something like this. Obviously the gold doubloon posted to the mast of the sailing vessel is supposed to symbolize man's inhumanity to man in this classic novel. And you blurt out, as some of us who are adults now have remember ourselves doing. How do you know that? This book was written in the early 1800s. Did you know the author? You look old enough. Yeah. <laughs> some of you got author inference and symbolism in novels within three or four days and you were fine. Some of you three or four months or years and some of you are thinking right now, oh lordy, I am so glad I don't join a book study group as an adult because I never get what the author was trying to say. Yeah, but when you finally got there, Whenever it was, we'd climb to the highest mountain and say, by golly, she knows it, or he knows it. And he'd be given full credit, full rights and privileges thereof, not some partial credit. What? At the DMV in Virginia, you have to get 80% to pass to get your license, your driver's license. First time I went, I got 20. Stay off the sidewalks. Rick is driving. <laughs> Next time I went, I got 100. Average the two together. Would I get my license? No. But I do. <laughs> they don't say, oh, I took you twice. You have to stay in the right lane, be off the road by 5 o'clock, and go less than 45 wherever you go. They don't do that. They trust the validity of the test to say you know it. So am I going <laughs> to hold kids to an arbitrary declaration of one calendar date? Or am I going to realize it might take some kids longer or shorter? And then some kids who are irresponsible don't use their time wisely. So they blow it off. And they come to you and say, I screwed up. <laughs> what can I do? Am I going to hold their learning hostage to their immature, morphing self? 
And we decided, you know what, the greater gift for kids in the long run is competence, not incompetence. And it turned out they matured faster by recovering from screwing up than they did by being labeled with a zero. So I said, you know what, you've got an F. All the consequences are coming your way with an F. But it's recoverable. That was the difference. Zeros are fine. Fs are fine. But really, we are commissioned to teach so that they learn it. Not merely say, here's the stuff. Rise and fall. Let me document your deficiencies. Come back tomorrow for more of the same rejection. No, it'll be fun. You'll like it. <laughs> it turns out so many teachers in our community were using grading as a gotcha enterprise. I present a curriculum, and I've caught you making mistakes. I've pointed it out to everybody involved in your life. But that wasn't teaching. <laughs> Teaching was, I teach so that you learn it. And if you're immature and irresponsible, I don't let that get in the way. I don't abdicate my adult responsibility. By golly, you will learn this. So a kid doesn't do the work. I say, what's the consequence? Doing the work, I will haunt your nightmares. <laughs> I have kids who come back from upper grade levels from college saying, I sort of kind of hated you, but I can't thank you enough. <laughs> and then even in the 80s, we were talking about grit, resilience, stick to -itiveness. How do you cultivate that? and other humans, and we started studying that, and we started doing lots of things, and I can talk to you about that another time or by phone if you want after tonight. But one of the things we did about fostering independence is take a look at our assessment grading practices. So we found this stuff really, really helpful, and it opened the door to living up to the promise of what school is actually supposed to be. Now, I am coming to you as both parent and practitioner. I am a product of the school district that in which I now work and serve, and my own kids came up through that. And so I'm on the other side of the parent-teacher conference table. And it's really awkward when the teacher knows that you're a teacher as well. <laughs> they can't get away with anything. Not that they're trying. But the idea that we speak the same language, and my kids are represented that, very successful, as we've gone through it forth. You should know that in my school district, we have 47 different nations in my one school building, and that's actually low. I send things home in 17 different languages. We have members of MS-13, Mara Salvatrucha, and uh, affiliates of the Crips and Blood, so we have violent gang members in my community. You should know that we have a, well, some schools are more than this. Ours is 57%. We have a 57% transiency rate. So more than half the children come into our building and leave the building in the course of the year. I live 20 minutes from the White House. So we have military attache, sons and daughters of senators, congressmen, ambassadors, and all their service staff. But we have a lot of high-tech folks that are there. We have lawyers and lobbyists coming in and, and kind of working with us in the schools. We have extremely focused college preparatory programs. And yeah, they all support this. We're also the second largest employer in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The largest one is the Norfolk Naval Base. Submarines, aircraft carriers, all down there. So we affect a lot of people. If we're going to make a decision to go this way, we do not take it lightly. We have to understand, you, we have vetted it with other equal demographic school districts and smaller ones and medium ones, everyone in between. We're one of the larger ones. We have 188,000 students. We're about 18,200 teachers in my one school district. So we affect a lot of people's lives. In fact, every single day, because teachers are out for maternity leave or sick or they have to go to in-service meeting, we have to find about 4,100 substitute teachers every single day. People who have been fingerprinted and in our system that don't otherwise have a job that day. It's crazy, I know. But seriously, we're a large ship. Large ships are hard to turn. Got it. But if we're gonna go down this road, we better know what we're talking about. So I'm hoping that you will trust that we've totally screwed up along the way. We've made global mistakes. And I'm trying to share with you the wisdom of that. And then working with high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools around the country and the world, and in many states multiple times, working with college admissions officers, working with college professors, working with high schools, middle schools, elementary schools that don't get in first but then do it. I go to one district, high schools doing standards-based assessment or grading, but boy, those elementary teachers, don't ask them to do it. I go to one that's right next door, another district, oh, the elementary is great, don't ask the high school to do it. And middle school is just a wasteland. Not really, not really, not really. I love middle school very much. In fact, my favorite place to teach. Most of my career has been middle school and high school. I did teach kindergarten. I was a, a, pretty much a climbing tree. That's all I was. And then they said, uh, we need you to move up and teach sex ed to the middle school boys. You're the only white chromosome in the building. Would you move us? Yeah, fine. So I did. But kindergarten was one of the best preparations I had for teaching eighth grade. No, let's take a look. 
Today, what we're going to do is I was told there are actually very specific areas. So I am begging you, please don't let this be the entire definition of standards-based grading. I would do things a little bit differently, but I will give you a few ideas on that. But I'm thinking that tonight, I'll be glad to answer questions and explain kind of some myths about standards-based grading. So you know what's going on. And you can look for evidence of it in the work coming home from teachers, if you want. And then also, people were wondering about rubrics, about retakes, homework, descriptive feedback. And then I was sent in advance all kinds of cool questions from the grading and reporting committee. Is that what you call it? Grading and reporting? Standards-based reporting and gra grading and reporting. Something like this. And I put those on slides. And so I'm going to answer each one of them as long as we have time available to us. And uh, if you want to talk more in depth about any of this stuff, you feel uncomfortable talking about it publicly, that's cool. You'll have my email address. There's a website that I just put up two weeks ago that always has my email on it if you like it. So I'm proud of it, rickwormley.com. Feel free to go take a look at some of the resources there. If you want to talk further, know that you get me for an evening, you now have me for a career. Really, for the rest of your lives, it's really okay. As long as I can vocalize, I think we're okay. When I'm 102, could you lay off? Thank you. A big part of standards-based assessment and grading is mindset. You know, the perspective you use to kind of filter everything. Do you guys remember Jaime Escalante? Stand and deliver and all that stuff. So AP calculus with inner city, mostly Hispanic youth, there's no way they're going to do well. They're not going to take calculus. And this teacher was like, I'm not going to give up. You will so learn this. I will go visit you in your homes. I will make sure you know stuff. Really intense, right? So they took the AP calculus exam and they totally knocked it out of the park. It was wonderful. Great scores. State of California said, oh, you must have cheated. See, what, that was their mindset. Inner city youth, Hispanic youth, no way. I said, what? Do it again. Oh, man. And they did it again, and they got the same result. That's a teacher I want for my own children. I will not give up on you. I will not give up on the state of California, have this mindset. So mindset is really the way we interact with the world, the filter we use to see everything. Okay, good. Standards-based assessment and grading has this mindset. I shall make sure this grade is accurate regarding the evidence of a standard. And that anything that might impugn or dilute the accuracy of it, I shall drop from my inclusion in it. We'll talk about that. Second one is this. When you're really into this mindset, you're willing to reassess to see if it's still valid every single year. Every single year, I need to decide what am I going to drop from my repertoire because I got too lazy and complacent with that. I'm always going to say, does it still hold water? One of the signs of a highly intellectual mind is you're willing to change your, your mind in light of new evidence and perspective. I hope that I'm always open and revisable to that, hence intellectual. The third is that I actually will have my actions match my philosophy, my principles. This is called having integrity. It's also called minimizing our hypocrisy. Every one of us, because the way schools are set up, really, principals, teachers, they might admit it to you, but let me tell you right now, this is actually what's happening. We walk into our building and we negotiate with ourselves for what level of hypocrisy we will tolerate today. And some days we're more tolerant of hypocrisy than we should be. So I tell teachers and principals, can you fight the good fight most of the time? Can you do the sound pedagogy? What we know to be good and true, wise and wonderful, 51% of the time or more, because you can't do it all the time. School conspires against it. Yeah, you may not be able to all the time, but you do it most of the time. Like in my class, I'm somebody who likes to, kids to do redos, but there are no redos, retakes at all the last week of the marking period. We, we're in a quarter system, so it's just nine weeks. What? When do children, high school, middle school, elementary, doesn't matter, when do students get most worried about their grades? The last week. For eight weeks, I'm Mr. Hopeful. But the last week, the grade book is cement, life is hard and then you die. Suck it up, junior. Why? Because I like to go home at night and be with my wife and my children. And I'm cleaning lab equipment. I'm doing report cards. So I just say, deal with it, dude. But if you submit a plan of action where you want to go back and seriously learn the stuff you screwed up, you didn't learn, I will be your loudest cheerleader. And the next marking period, I'll submit a grade change report form. It says he didn't know it that eight weeks or nine weeks, but now he does. The grade book is cumulative for the year. I don't know if you're aware of that. It's the way it's supposed to be. Because it's incredibly arbitrary that we say, you have nine months to learn all of this. I got to tell you, Robert Marzano, that's a name that might float out there in the, in the blogosphere as you study this. He did a study back in 1998. It was repeated in the late aughts and it was even worse. How long does it take 
to teach all the stuff currently listed K-12, kindergarten through 12th grade, to a basic human, you know, regular person, no real ch learning challenges. And they look, okay, this standard, it takes about this, this concept, you know, like the wet paper towel with the bean sprout and the little cup in kindergarten and what that all teaches and everything else that happens between kindergarten and 12th grade. How long does it take? Here's what they found, to grade 22. What? We graduate children at grade what? 12. We're 10 years shy. If we were living up to the promise of what teachers swear they try to teach to school, to students, and do justice by all those standards, we should probably have you graduate from high school at age 27 and 28. Now I'm looking at some of you, some of you look younger than that, like you're 22 or 24 or something like that, and you're going, I think I'm okay, I seem to learn it all. You really didn't. <laughs> Neither did we. But it's this big pretense we put on. So you do the best you can, but a lot of teachers in high school and middle school in particular do stuff like this. Here's a bunch of stuff, take a test. Here's some more stuff, take another test. Here's some more stuff, take this test. You didn't learn it when I taught it to you? Well, that just stinks, but join us when you can. <laughs> and we march through the year like this, like this is a good treatment of their future. It's not. We have very simplistic algorithms. Think about this. I have to teach this concept. What will I do? I think I'll have the children do flashcards. We'll watch two movies. I'll do three lectures. Here's a website. <gasps> Role playing. Let's do that for 20 minutes. And a test on Friday. And the next week comes and we do three or four or five other activities and we have a test on Friday and we think that's teaching. It's not even close to moving this to long-term memory. The real testimony for a teacher and for a letter grade is what kids carry forward. Not what they demonstrated when they're in that unit for four weeks. And even the exit sign reminds them how to divide fractions. You guys remember Dead Poet Society? Do you remember the scene where they go out to the little soccer grass area and they're kicking the ball, listening to classical music, and reciting a piece of poetry? That's cool. See, the wise teachers make you do math outside of math class. Science, out of science class. If you're in the context, learning is so contextual, I, I can only do decimals when I'm looking at my teacher's Calvin and Hobbes cartoon collection on the wall next to the fire extinguisher? <laughs> you make me do it in another classroom. I, how many of you ever experienced this? You're doing math in a history class? Or English, this is not a math class. You can't make us do math here. It seems weird, but that's the mental dexterity we're talking about. And we don't want to have simplistic notions of how to teach. We're out to teach for long-term retention, and that might be different for different kids. We can do that. We can live up to that promise. It's our mindset. So what we do is we get principles behind it, and then we can solve our own problems. For example, we might have weird situations. I have English language learners in my class. I have students with learning disabilities. I have a gifted, quite advanced set of students. This regular grade level stuff is not appropriate, whatever it is. And we decide our operating principles, our mindset. So for example, this teacher, okay, it happens to be me. This teacher thinks that great teachers have to be ethical. Really, it has to be totally ethical, moral, everything. I can't knowingly falsify a grade. Cool. Second, grades must be accurate in order to be useful. I cannot make a decision based on something that is inaccurate. It must be an accurate portrayal. Good. Third, report cards can only report against regular publicly posted things. I tell teachers all the time, hey, if this is a publicly posted thing that parents have in their hands, what's taught in this grade level, what's taught in this grade level, you can grade it. Totally cool. If it's not there, the report card can't report it. It's got to be an addendum. It's got to be something outside of that. Because a report card is kind of a contract between parents and schools. Here's where your child is doing against society's determined standards. So that's cool. So if the kid's going way above that, or he's not even close to that, he's reading like three grade levels below, the report card can only report against regular standards for that grade level, and I have to give another addendum or some other way to report that other stuff. It's just a way to be honest, because grades are first and foremost communication. They're information, that's it. They're not a bartering system, they're just communication. So, last one there, if I do some kind of test and the student totally knows it, but the test doesn't allow that to be revealed, I think the teacher is obligated to actually change the format of the test. What? Think about it. Some of you might have experienced this when you were kids, but teachers have to deal with this all the time. They talk to the students, they totally know they know it. They have all this evidence in the world but they take the test and the kid bombs it. Does that ever happen? Yeah. Okay, what's going on? You know it rock solid, but you didn't. 
So you investigate, and you might change the vehicle, the medium used to represent that, because I'm about evidence. But what if I'm actually teaching the test format? Think about that. I had a kid one time come up to me and go, Mr. Warmly, I know you like alternative assessment from time to time in order to elicit the same universal evidence. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing in the hands of adolescents. <laughs> okay, um, so instead of persuasive essay, I want to do a persuasive diorama. <laughs> I'm not teaching diorama, dude. You, you, it's non-negotiable. No, how about a puppet show? I'll do a puppet show. It's very persuasive. <laughs> no, you actually have to do the essay. I'm teaching essay. But if I was teaching photosynthesis, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, the genesis of adenosine triphosphate, whatever it was, I could just interview him. Off the top of my head, the vehicle didn't, rem didn't matter as much as the evidence. That's huge. Are you evidentiary? Do you remember the movie Jerry Maguire? What was the tagline? Show me the money. I tell the kids all the time, show me the evidence. Swarmly, how can I get my grade up in your class? Can I do a summary of that show on Nova on PBS on Friday and bring it in Monday and like raise my science grade or my history grade or whatever this show is about? No. Okay, um, do you like it? Allow extra credit? Because <laughs> I need sports eligibility. I need to get my grade up. No, but I have a secret. Here's how you get a grade up. It's really cool. Every time students do this, the grade goes up like a letter grade or two. Would you like to know what it is? I'm like, yeah, yeah. All right, ready? Lean in. Here it is. Learn what I'm teaching you. Wait a minute before you get all happy. If you allow redos for 100% full credit, extra credit is now obsolete and irrelevant. And the teacher did not undermine herself by allowing something to just be skipped. Substitute something else in that's, do a poster in the library, that'll be fine. No, you actually have to learn it. Show me the evidence. So the kids get this language. I have to be evidentiary? You mean if I actually show you? You mean I actually have to learn it? Yes. You can't buffer your grades by doing service for younger age children. You can't buffer at all. You can't play that game. What's really uncomfortable is some kids who've been coasting by buffering their grades by doing a lot of peripheral things. I'll clean your animal cages. I came after school and helped you sort those papers for the new fundraising thing we're doing. And I got extra points in my grade book. You can't do that anymore. Oh, you can do that. Give the kid a coupon from a favored merchant in the community. Give him some other bribery. And call it bribery, because that's really what it is. But you can't change the grade. It's too valuable. It's too important. As I was sharing with teachers today, you may not realize this, but in 2012, something awful happened in the United States. Or actually, two things that were pretty bad about college level, but we'll do the first one for right now. First is this. 40%, it used to be 30, 40% of the kids who go into college have to retake high school courses in the United States because the grades are false reports. At the University of Alaska, when I was working with them three years ago, it was 60%. The state of California was 50. That's pretty bad. I was just in Alabama. The superintendent came up and said 35% in Alabama. So it's out there. Do you want to have integrity? Our grades mean what they say. The critical mass is rising. They better mean something and no foo-foo fluff. So this is actually very challenging and very demanding as you go through it. So, then we have English language learners, the principal's there, I think they have a right to have an accurate assessment. And I also realize that in America, we make a big mistake. We equate thinking proficiency with language proficiency, because that's the best way, the most common way we use to figure out what you're thinking. But what if I did this with a kid who didn't speak English very well? Um, I ask a question, and the child says, uh, <laughs> um, you see, what are you thinking? He doesn't know it. But he's actually trying to translate what you said is language and find the words to say back, but also do the cultural reference. And that gets to the third one. Sometimes they don't have the background of the cultural reference. For example, I said compare and contrast the following. He didn't know that meant similarities and differences. And he didn't know that compare when it's by itself also means similarities and differences. Just when it's by itself. Some of you are thinking, that's why I didn't do so well in high school. I didn't know that either. Okay, fine. But this is a teacher who has the mindset of, oh, there's conversational English and there's academic English. And I need to be sensitive to that. That's huge. Only after I decide my mindset can I actually start my grading policies and what actions I'm going to take. So you have to understand what I'm building for you here is a sense of that, well, how do teachers think behind the scenes? So then they look at their policies to see 
if they have the integrity. Mindset is also talked about a lot, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I want to get to some of the grading stuff, but Carol Dweck is very famous in teacher circles. She talks about growth mindset versus fixed intelligence. She writes whole books. There's a really popular book at bookstores called Mindset, actually, and about three or four of the chapters are about teaching. A better book for teachers and parents is Self Theories, and what she did is she follows fifth grade all the way through high school, college, and beyond to see who has the more functional families versus dysfunctional families in the larger world, who gets the higher salary earnings, who achieves higher academic success in college, and what was their experience like with teachers? Did their teachers have a growth mindset? I don't know it now, but if I work hard enough, I could so come to know it. IQ is not set at birth. I can learn a foreign language to the fluency of a native speaker in my 40s and 50s, not just if I don't <laughs> learn it by the time I'm four. I can still learn it. That's kind of cool. That, creates grit and so on, resilience, stick to itiveness, endurance, versus teachers who had fixed intelligence. Here's a kid who has fixed intelligence. I was never good at math. I will never be good at math. I don't have a math gene in my body. Just give me the test and let me take my F. Like there's no hope for me. When actually there's neuroplasticity, you can be malleable, you can actually learn the stuff if you work hard enough. Well, it turns out the kids who had, of course, the growth mindset went on to be much more successful, achieve higher levels. Teachers who had the fixed intelligence, and the kids who had those teachers, steady diet of them, they were more dysfunctional in their families, they couldn't solve problems as well, they didn't high, uh, go as high in academic achievement in college. It was a mess. So if you want empirical evidence, Carol Dweck is one to go through with that. She's really very good at that. So you got lots of ideas. So let's talk about this assessment grading, kind of get off the mindset, but you'll see how what I just described is manifest in these policies. What is standards-based grading? To cut to the chase, it's basically this. To assess and grade based purely on evidence of standards, nothing else. Okay, and if it's in the course curriculum description, you can grade it. But if it's not there, you're off the island, weakest link, I extinguish your torch. You're out of there. But wait a minute, if you really get into that, a lot of conventional practices are now suspect. They come up really lacking. And a lot of times parents and teachers want to still do it it was done to me when I was a child, and I grew up to be a supposedly okay adult. <laughs> Maybe not. So, what are some of those policies that might be affected? Let's take a look. You have to realize that percentages and rubric scores and letter grades are complete nonsense. There are placeholders that attach like a ballpark indicator of evidence. So let's think about that for a minute. A, B, C, D, F. By the way, why do a lot of school districts just skip over E and go to F? E is the next natural letter in the sequence, right? So E could stand for what? Excellent, exemplary, right? They might be confused. Let's go to F, because F stands for? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Look at you. You all thought it did. They don't stand for anything. A doesn't stand for awesome. B, better. C, conventional, complacent. D, you know what that stands for, of course? Duh. Oh, for some kids, D is done. <laughs> no, they don't stand for anything. They're nonsense. I mean, think about it. On a 4.0 scale, 43210, if you had the regular one, the regular GPA one, 43210, what's a two as a letter grade? It's a C, right? What's two out of four as a percent? 50, which is usually what letter grade? F. Ah! In the same marking period, we used 100 point scale, 4.0, 3.0. Check, check, minus and zero, personal observation, every the leap year, and pfft, here's the grade. <laughs> Don't call me in over the summer if somebody complains about the grade. I have no idea how I got it in February. <laughs> this is insane. So what we found is this. Whatever your scale, the symbol you use, doesn't matter, percentages, letter grades, must tie to a descriptor of evidence. It turns out when you do that, a B in my class represents the same level of learning as a B in your class. You guys know it's not urban legend, right? Kid learns this amount, it's an A to one teacher, but it's only a B or C to another teacher in the same building. That's not fair, I did the same amount of learning, and I got, and I'm only got a C. Yeah, you're right, it's not fair. And that school's faculty cannot claim to the community they are consistent and have integrity, because they never calibrated their evidence for what they would tolerate. I tell people all the time, stop thinking you're, you're doing a lot of good use of taxpayer money by reading the standards. You can read the standards in 35 seconds. The thing you really earn your money, it's good use of time, planet Earth's oxygen, is for teachers to say what evidence 
will we tolerate? You're evidentiary. That's what standards-based grading is.